Hello there, welcome to the Football Block. My name is Brandon. Today we're going to look back at match day two of the 2023 Gold Cup group stage. So if that sounds interesting, then let's hop right into it. One step beyond! <laughs> So match day two has concluded. We have every single one of the teams in this competition has played their second match. We've had some massive blowout scores. We've had some nil-nil draws as well. But let's look back at each match individually and see how each team did. See who's qualified to the group stage, to the knockout stage, I mean, so far from the group stage. So who's been eliminated mathematically. Um, who stood out, what are their best goals. You know, who didn't show up, who, you know, had a terrible performance, things like that. So, let's start off with the first match of the second match day, and that was Jamaica against Trinidad. Now, this match ended up as a 4-1, very convincing win for the Jamaicans. And if you look at this match on paper, and you look at who scored, you look at see, Damari Gray scored twice, you know, Leon Bailey scored another, and then you see it just, you know look at the number of shots look at the possession just everything on paper this looks like a dominant win from jamaica this looks like the jamaicans have finally clicked and everything is looking good everything and everything looks good going forward for this team now i'm not going to sit here and say that this wasn't a dominant win obviously it was 4-1 but I think the scoreline is a little deceiving. That's not to say that Jamaica didn't play well. Of course, they scored four goals. That being said, I think this is much more on Trinidad and Tobago playing terribly and particularly defending terribly more so than Jamaica being outstanding. Uh, now, if you look at all of the goals that Jamaica scored, they all come from incredibly awful defending from Trinidad and Tobago. That's a common theme that you see throughout this entire tournament so far. Some very suspect defending, which again, you know, sometimes is a shame to see. It's it's not really a great representative of North America, but at the same time, it kind of, it is what it is. Uh, this, if you compare all the confederations, the Gold Cup is, is probably, besides Oceania, of course, is probably the, the worst out of all of them. I mean, it also makes for exciting games. You get a lot of goals, and this game is uh, evidence of that. Uh, now, like I said, each and every one of the goals came from a defensive mistake. Like, for example, Leon Bailey. How did he have that much time? How was he that wide open to score the second goal? The third goal, uh, the goal, the ball is completely stripped off the Trinidadian defender. Um, you know, Mikhail Antonio almost trips over the ball and is able to pass it right to Demar Gray for his second goal of the night and for Jamaica's third. And then the fourth goal is a wicked deflection. Now, this one, maybe not so much poor defending because you can't really do anything about the deflection. It took a wicked deflection off the defender's thigh and went into the goal. But still, it's not like Jamaica was tearing Trinidad and Tobago's defense apart with intricate build-up play. Um, and you know dynamic crosses into the box and players moving around things like that but of course that's you know at the end of the day Jamaica go walk away with three goals or three points and four goals on the board you know their uh, goal difference is going up their goal difference looks really good at the moment so far obviously because they drew the first game against the US this doesn't count as uh, or they, and they haven't qualified for the knockout stage officially yet but you know, considering their next game against is against St. Kitts and the Nevis, it looks pretty much assured. Now, granted, it depends on how much they beat St. Kitts and the Nevis by whether who tops the group between the U.S. and Jamaica. But, it, you know, they can be pretty comfortable at this point. Speaking of St. Kitts and the Nevis, they went up against the U.S. in the next match. And this match was complete and utter destruction. It was a 6-0 smashing victory for the americans right here in this match 
Uh, Brian Reynolds got a really nice goal, one of the, probably the goal of the tournament, in my opinion. Uh, he also scored on his birthday. Um, Mihailovic scored two, and Jesus Fajeda scored three. So, very dominant win, like I said. Now, you can't really take a whole lot out of this because, you know, we talked about this in the last video. St. Kitts and the Nevis is a Caribbean island that has a population less than 50,000. You can't expect them to go up against the United States, you know, the best team in the region. Yes, it's the C squad, but still, you cannot expect them to go up against the United States and come away with any type of results. This is expected, and I even said, kind of in a joking term, but it's pretty serious, actually. Uh, I said this to my friends. Anything less than a 4-0 destruction for the U.S. is a disappointment. I think the U.S. did just enough. They played well. Um, you, like I said, you can't take much out of this game. I, I think some players in particular played really well. Um, I, I think that Jesus Fajeda, like, again, this guy has a crazy goal scoring record for the United States. It's not against some of the top quality teams. It's a lot of, it's against a lot of random Caribbean islands, but still, I mean, I'll, he's gotten a lot of flack for that in my opinion, but I disagree with that. I think you still have to give credit where credit is due. The guy has been scoring goals for his country, maybe not in the most important games, but still, a goal is a goal. Um, like I said before, Brian Reynolds, goal of the tournament, and the United States did did good in this to really rack up the goals to make sure that they qualify over Jamaica for top spots. In this game, all we have to do is sure up a win against Trinidad and Tobago in the next match day. Uh, and at least match or exceed the 4-0 results or 4-1 results that Jamaica got in the last game. On the next day, we had Qatar versus Honduras in a game that, despite it, you know, having goals in it, there's been a few, uh, as we will talk about a bit, two 0-0 draws. I think this game is probably the most boring game of the entire tournament so far. It didn't really seem like either team really wanted to attack. Especially when you consider Qatar scored early on and then they just sat back and parked a bus and were happy to attempt to grind out that one nothing victory. Didn't work out in the end for them, but they tried. And I think this is characteristic of a Carlos Kirosh team. Uh, now, I am actually a fan of Carlos Kirosh. I, I think that he's a great manager if you look at what he did for Egypt, getting them all the way to the AFCON final getting this close to winning the entire thing by playing this you know, negative football. I, I think you, you have to give him so much applause for that. Um, you know, he really he had did some good things with Iran as well throughout the years. You know, even at the last World Cup, it wasn't perfect. There was a lot of, you know, political turmoil going on behind the scenes, but still he was able to come away with that 2-0 win over Wales, which is one of Iran's only victories at a World Cup. And here... I don't think it's working out, to be honest. Granted, I don't think it's all his fault because Qatar is going into this with a backup squad. There's only one or two starters that are in the entire squad, maybe three or four. But it's, you know, what do you expect for him to do? Even still, this performance has been pretty poor. Um, I would even argue, even though they lost in the last game, I think this performance here against Honduras is even worse. Uh, they com got completely outplayed by Honduras for the most part. Um, now, they let Honduras have the ball. They let Honduras come on to them. But Honduras looked very dangerous. They had some numerous chances. It looked like Qatar attempted to, you know, push the pressure on to Honduras to attack. But then they couldn't handle it. Uh, and remember, this is Honduras, the same Honduras side, that got completely demolished by Mexico 4-0 in the last match. A team that couldn't defend for their lives. I was hoping for Qatar to, you know, not play tiki taka possession based style completely dominate the game but at least really attempt to go at this Honduran defense and you know really try to poke through the gaps that they do have and they did not do that um and Honduras you know they weren't as clinical as they can be but you have to understand this team their only attack going for us uh, forward is Ellis the uh you know famous striker for the team and Credit to him, he was able to score and grab a 1-1 draw with a very acrobatic, very nice goal at the end. Was a bit lucky. Uh, I think, you know, the goalkeeper for Qatar can count himself as unlucky, but it was a very acrobatic, very aesthetically pleasing finish from Ellis, which 
ended the game 1-1 and you know this like i said this game was very tense it was you know kind of violent at times but you can't really say that qatar deserved anything more they did not play well if anything you can even argue that Honduras deserved the win so on to the next match of Group B. We have Mexico going up against Haiti in a very high profile match considering Haiti came away with a win in the last game uh, against Qatar. And Mexico, they completely destroyed Honduras, but Honduras, like I said before, played really bad. So there was a question over how good this Mexican side was. And I don't think this win here is an eventual 3-1 win over Haiti. I don't think that you can say that Mexico is back yet, but this was a very important win and this was a necessary win. It was a very necessary performance. Similar to the last game, each of these games here are, are must wins for Mexico. And I think the first half was a little disjointed. Haiti didn't really do much. They held on, they defended well. They restricted Mexico to only a few clear cut chances, but Mexico, they, didn't look like they were working together as well as they were in the match against um, Honduras. I don't think they had the same level of intensity. However, second half comes around and Mexico did have that uh, intensity. They were able to score very early on, similar to the last match, the beginning of the last match at least. Henry Martin scored a really nice header here. And I think then the match opened up a little bit. Haiti did have some chances. Haiti was able to capitalize on some poor mistakes from Mexico. As I said before, in the last match against Honduras, as good as Mexico was going forward, they had some almost near calamities at the back. And that was almost exposed here by Haiti. And you would expect if Mexico to go up against teams with a much more clinical attack, whether it be, you know, someone like the US or, you know, even someone like Panama or something like that, that these mistakes would not go unpunished. But in this match, it did. And Mexico came away with a 3-1 win after an own goal, a very unfortunate own goal from a Haitian defender. Haiti got one back off a corner. Um, side note, Mexico, I think defending set pieces, that's something they really need to work on. Um, but before Haiti could really piece together some type of comeback, Santi Jimenez came off the bench and scored a header himself. You know, very good goal from him. It was nice to see him score that, you know, considering the crowd reception to him. So I think that, like I said before, this is an important win. It's a necessary win. Mexico had to come away with the results in this match. Um, they made up for a underwhelming uh, performance in the first half with a very high intensity performance in the second half. But Mexico is not back yet. These are results against Honduras and Haiti, not necessarily top class opposition, not to mention they do have some visible defensive frailties. Next up, we have Martinique versus Panama. And this is a game that I personally was very excited for considering how good these two teams played in their previous matches. I think Martinique played incredibly intelligent. They were very smart to come away with a 2-1 win over El Salvador. Now there were times that they got outplayed. There was times that they lacked the possession. They did like to sit back and try to hit on the counter, but they were very, very efficient at that. Can compare that to Panama, who completely steamrolled Costa Rica in a match that ended 2-1, but it really could have been 3-4-0 or something like that. And I was, you know, interesting to see. I was interested to see uh, how these two teams would line up against each other. And it looked like Martinique wanted to just sit back and defend and hit on the counter. Do the same exact thing that they did against El Salvador uh, and Panama. Funnily enough, try to do the same exact thing that they did against Costa Rica. Just completely dominate possession and then try to overwhelm them, especially with crosses into the box. Utilize the strength that they have in the wings and also the clinical striker in Fajardo. And I think considering you look at these two teams and their contrasting styles, Panama came away with a 2-1 win. And I think that just goes to show they have a much superior quality and talent on the field when you compare their players one-to-one. -one. Um, Martinique had virtually no chances in the first half. Panama, on the other hand, had chance after chance after chance, many of which they really should have scored. They looked like they were getting a little nervous in front of goal. They were, you know, looked like it was going to be one of those days. But then the second half came around, and then I think they got their act together. They were able to calm down a little bit, and they raced to a 2-0 lead, and I think just like the last match, it could have been more, 
but I think they kind of tired themselves out a little bit because they did allow Martinique to come back and get a consolation goal, similar to how Costa Rica was able to get a consolation goal um, in the last match. And, you know, that might be a cause for concern as Panama progresses further and further through this tournament. But for the majority of the game, minute one all the way up until, say, let's say, minute 80, Panama looked very, very good. Uh, this Panamanian team looks to be serious opposition heading forward throughout this tournament. Uh, particularly, as I mentioned already, the strength that they have down the wings and then the clinical striker in Fajardo in the middle. The amount of quality crosses that are sent into the box is insane. Uh, now, Fajardo, he did score in this game, but he could have arguably had a hat trick. He had one that he flipped his lines, there was one that was saved. The amount of quality crosses coming in cannot be understated. And any team that is going up against Panama in the next few matches here needs to be very, very careful about the wingers. And with these two wins here, Panama, along with Mexico, qualified for the knockout rounds. The next match in this group was El Salvador versus Costa Rica, and this match ended in a nil-nil draw. That being said, both teams had a myriad of chances, and I'm so surprised that this ended without either team scoring a single goal. Um, I think that El Salvador, for the most part, was actually the better team. Now, Costa Rica had some serious chances at the beginning, throughout the first half, but El Salvador looked like they controlled the game much more. They looked like they were much more comfortable on the ball. Uh, they were moving the ball around much more intelligently, and they even hit the crossbar. The striker, heel crashed a shot off the crossbar. That one, he should be putting away. He really should be putting that away. It was wide open goal. And it's such a shame when you look at Costa Rica's team, because this is a team that was just at the last World Cup. This is a team that has gone far in the Gold Cup before. This is a team that consistently has been making World Cups. They have quality players, but they are nearing the end of a generation. Those same players are very, very old. I think this team is, is just losing their magic. And it is sad to see, it's, it's inevitable, but it is sad to see in this case because Costa Rica, I think, really did get lucky in this case. It should have it should have been an El Salvador victory. That being said, Costa Rica did have some serious chances at the end. Joel Campbell had some shot, had a few shots that he really should have put away. There was a few other players. They were really looking to pressure El Salvador at the end. I believe El Salvador looked like they were getting really tired. They weren't able to hold on. They weren't able to hold back the Costa Rican attackers. But it just goes to show that the magic in this Costa Rican team is lost because they weren't able to put away any of those chances. And then the match concluded. It ended two goose eggs on the scoreboard, 0-0. A result that doesn't help either team considering they just lost their last match, making the next match a must win for both of these teams. Now, the last two matches we're gonna look at here um, is Cuba versus Guadeloupe as well as Canada versus Guatemala. Now, the first match of the two, Cuba versus Guadeloupe, not really a match that jumps off at the paper at you. It's uh, not really a match that garners a lot of international or even, you know, regional uh, attention. That being said, this match was one of the most exciting games of the entire tournament so far. Um, I think Guadeloupe, I, I had no expectations for them. I did not think that a team that is not even an independent country that's still technically part of France would really make any waves in this tournament. And yet, you know, they shocked Canada in the first game. Uh, they held on for a 2-2 draw. And this game, they completely destroyed Cuba in style. Now, Cuba, probably on paper, you know, besides St. Kitts, is probably the worst team in this tournament. But still, you got to play who's in front of you. And the way Guadeloupe beat uh, Cuba. It, it wasn't like the way Guatemala beat um, Cuba, where it was a very, a very close 1-0 draw. This game, Guadeloupe completely tore apart Cuba, and they made it look easy, and they made it look fun. Each of these goals, the four of them, are contenders for goal of the tournament. And in fact, you know, let's say Brian Reynolds' goal against St. Kitts and the Nevis is the number one best goal of the tournament so far. These four goals for Guadeloupe are the next in the top five. That's how good they were. Uh, I mean, you look at the first goal from Phaeton, he picks up the ball and, you know, he rolls it and then just unleashes a missile into the top corner. 
no way the goalkeeper can stop that. And then Plumain, you know, from a similar position, just unleashes a shot, flies right past the goalkeeper, no chance for him again. And then Fanton again scores another beautiful long shot, this time in the lower bottom corner. Uh, these guys were competing for who can score a better goal. Now, Cuba did get a penalty and they were able to score a very obvious foul, a very obvious penalty. But, you know, before there was any chance of a Cuban comeback, the Guadalupe player, Baron, scored a beautiful, skillful goal, an utterly humiliating goal. He completely took the ball, did two back heels, flipped around, and then toe poked the ball past the Cuban goalkeeper. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend going on YouTube and looking at the highlights of that. You know, it was a filthy, filthy goal. I saw that my jaw dropped to the floor. Uh, it's, you know, each of these four goals, I, I know, Guadalupe versus Cuba, not necessarily a match that pops off the paper, but, I highly recommend looking at the highlights of these. You know, I think Guadalupe completely dominated the match. They look great, they look good. Yes, you can say that it's it's Cuba, but hey, look at how good Guadalupe was against Canada. And I think they pretty much have a lock to qualify for the knockout rounds as long as they keep it consistent, and as long as they keep their eyes on the prize. Who knows, Guadalupe could be uh, the surprise team of this tournament. Now on to the last match we're going to look at today. And this one was a very, very disappointing match. We have Guatemala versus Canada. Now, Canada, uh, they sent most of their A squad to this tournament, I would argue. Um, yes, there was no Afonso Davies. There is no Jonathan David. But you still have Bourian. You still have Estacchio. You still have Poilet, Osorio. Uh, you still have most of the defense there. And... Even still, I have, I don't know what it is with this Canadian team. They, they look terrible. They look really bad. Remember, this is a team that qualified at the top of the table for the CONCACAF qualifying for the World Cup. This is a team that played at the 2022 World Cup. Most of these guys, maybe not, if, if not most, then a lot of them played in the Qatar in the 2022 World Cup. They played at the last Gold Cup when they got all the way to the semifinals and were only beat very narrowly by Mexico and then they were part of that team that beat the US that beat Mexico that finished top of the table and yet they can't even beat Guatemala here uh, in fact I I would argue that Guatemala was probably the better team Guatemala was kind of unlucky to come away with a draw in this match uh, considering their chances at the end because for the entirety of the first half and most of the second half to be honest it, it looked like neither team wanted to attack it, this game you know, besides that Qatar versus Honduras game, this game is up there for the most boring match of the Gold Cup so far. It was it was a bore. It was really hard to watch. Both teams had some chances, but they were nothing but half chances. It was, a, you know, a volley from outside of the box, a long shot that went flying over, uh, you know, some type of shot from outside of the box that, you know, was way off target from both teams. Uh, it wasn't until I think both teams started to get really tired started to lose the composure that it really started to open up and even still even as the match started to open up and Canada was getting closer and closer to the goal they didn't look like scoring they weren't clinical at all there was no cohesion in this team there was no desire to win it was almost as if Canada went into this tournament with so much kind of arrogance for lack of a better term thinking that you know oh we got the easiest group out of all the big teams we should just it's a cakewalk through this and they've been really struggling and on, on the other hand Guatemala you know, you can't really expect much of this team. As I mentioned before, they they only narrowly beat Cuba in their last match. And yet, I think they had some serious chance. They really pushed Canada all the way to the end here. Canada is in serious danger of missing out in the knockout stage. They could go out in the group stage here. Canada really need to have a result against Cuba in the last match. Now, you would expect them to beat Cuba, but at the same time, you could have easily said, you expect them to beat Guatemala, you expect them to beat Guadalupe. So who knows? But anyway, guys, that has been my reaction. That has been my analysis of every single match in match day two of the 2022, or 2023, sorry, Gold Cup. Let me know what you thought of all the matches here. Uh, if you have any questions, make sure to type them in the comments below. If you have answers to my questions, make sure to type them in the comments below. For example, do you think Canada 
is going to go out in the group stage. Do you think Guadeloupe can be the surprise team this time around? Who do you think is going to top the group between Jamaica and the U.S.? Um, do you think Mexico is going to keep up this winning streak? Uh, do you think Panama is a potential you know, contender? As I've said before, they've been playing pretty good. And similarly with Canada, is Costa Rica done? Can they qualify for 